Hello, welcome to the Melbourne Convention Centre and to this ICT for Life Sciences Forum presentation. I'm Luan Ismahil, the Executive Director of the Forum, and on behalf of the Forum sponsors, uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, this forum was established in October 2008 for the purpose of connecting the then small but now significantly larger community of interest at the intersection of the life and physical sciences. Melbourne has a fantastic reputation, well deserved, for medical and scientific research, one that's been developed over many decades. But life sciences research problems have become more complex, knowledge continues to grow exponentially, and technologies are advancing at a rapid rate. In 2011, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, published a report, the third revolution, the convergence of the life sciences, physical sciences and engineering, in which it made a compelling case why the convergence of the life and physical sciences will not only advance fundamental science, but will be crucial to improved public health. It was called the third revolution biology, following the molecular and genetic revolutions. This is how the report defined convergence. Convergence means a broad rethinking of how all scientific research can be conducted so that we can capitalise on a range of knowledge bases from microbiology to computer science to engineering design. In other words, the convergence revolution does not rest on a particular scientific advance, but on a new integrated approach for achieving advances. Only in the past week or so, there have been announcements that may have been considered science fiction if they were announced a decade ago, but which today reflect the growing importance of convergent science. Bioengineers at Tufts University in Boston have created a functional 3D-like brain tissue in rats that provides a new way for studying normal brain function, as well as injury and disease, with the hope that it could one day lead to the development of new treatments for brain dysfunction. Researchers at UCLA have developed a disposable biosensor that monitors gastrointestinal disorders to help doctors definitely determine which post-operative patients should be fed and which should not, decreasing healthcare costs and hospital stays. Scientists at the University of California, San Diego, converted skin cells from an 86-year-old man into human-induced pluripotent stem cells that were grafted into rats suffering spinal cord injury, which produced tens of thousands of cells showing some restored ability to move affected limbs. And IBM announced the development of True North, a microchip with a million electronic neurons that mimics the human brain. The chip could be combined with other cognitive computing technologies to create systems that learn, reason, and help humans make better decisions. Welcome to the exciting world of convergence research. Through events such as this, the ICT for Life Sciences Forum is committed to engaging with the community, to inspire us about the possibilities convergence science offers for a healthy society, and to inspire researchers and industry to play a role in continuing to make Victoria an innovative and prosperous region of the world. If you'd like to learn more about convergence and access a number of important reports in this field, please visit the Convergence 2014 website, convergence2014.org.au. Uh, to introduce our guest speaker, I would like to welcome Professor Peter Ebeling, Head of the Department of Medicine at Monash University. <coughs> Professor Ebeling. Well, thanks very much, um, Lewin, for asking me to introduce Alan Trouss, and it's really a great honour for me to do this. Uh, with my association with Monash University and also Alan's long-term association with that university in the past. He really is a pioneer, both in the realms of IVF, but also in stem cell biology. And I'm sure we're going to be excited by his talk this evening about the new applications of stem cells in transforming human disease. But really, where his career began was with the Merino sheep at the University of New South Wales. 
And uh, I guess that was your first love, Alan the Sheep. <laughs> I, I'm concerned you may actually be a New Zealander, but um, anyway, at that time, uh, he was really successful and set up the Australian Gene Storage Resource Centre. And he was really a pioneer in conserving genetic material uh, derived from endangered species in, in that regard. And then from there, he went to the University of Cambridge. I think there weren't many sheep there. Um, uh, but then he returned to Australia, and importantly, he was invited to a job by Professor Carl Wood, who was the inaugural professor of women's health and obstetrics and gynaecology at Monash uh, University. So Carl and Alan really hit it off, and from there it's really history. We know that the first IVF birth was at Monash University, and I think uh, something like seven out of the first 10 human IVF uh, conceptions and births were at Monash University. And of course, uh, that led to a lot of controversy um, and hate mail and all these sorts of things that happen when you're doing pioneering research and you're on the very edge. And um, so that was sort of unfortunate in a way, but then Alan's career really went uh, from stride to stride and building on his IVF expertise, uh, he went on to pioneer now commonplace IVF techniques such as the use of fertility drugs, systems for egg collection and embryo donation for infertile females, embryo freezing and sperm injection techniques for male infertility, and importantly, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for inheritable diseases. Now, these are all things that are used in the clinic today and we take them as commonplace. But in those days, it was all pioneering work. And in 2000, his team announced that nerve cells could be derived from embryonic stem cells. And this is a discovery that triggered world interest in the potential of stem cells to cure many diseases, which we'll hear about tonight. And again, there was criticism from conservative groups at this time because of the transformation of these cells but eventually it became, led to changes in legalisation of embryonic stem cell research in Australia. And I think, again, Monash University researchers and associates were leading the battle to get this legislation passed in federal parliament. Uh, at that time, Alan held uh, multiple prestigious positions at Monash. He was director of the Centre of Early Human Development, deputy director of the Institute of Reproduction and Development, and had personal chairs in obstetrics and gynaecology paediatrics and in stem cell sciences. And in 2002, he was the inaugural CEO of the Australian Stem Cell Centre and was appointed to the role of Director of Monash Immunology and Stem Cell Laboratories in 2003. But then in 2007, a, a remarkable event occurred and uh, that was when Alan was appointed as the permanent president of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine which was a $3 billion agency. So he was going from somewhere where he was king of his realm to somewhere to an even greater realm. And I think the foundation of this institute is very interesting in that the whole government and people of California, as well as philanthropy and Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was the governor at that time, got behind it. And it was a groundswell of public opinion as well as scientific opinion that this should occur. So this was indeed convergence of the public and science. And really his scientific journeys continued from that and uh, he's really uh, been continuing research in that area. And I think throughout this great development of a, a wonderful career as a pioneer, he's never lost touch with the lab. And I think probably, Alan, that's where you feel most comfortable. So. Welcome back to Melbourne, and we're looking forward to your lecture tonight. Thanks very much for coming. So thank you. It's very nice to be here. <clears throat> I think it's the fourth day that I'm back, really. Um, I arrived, uh, arrived back in Australia at 4 o'clock uh, Friday morning, so it, there has, we haven't had very long to sort of get accustomed to, to, to Australia, to Melbourne again. Um, the last place I visited was Addis Ababa, and it was rather different to, to, to the weather and the community that you have here, but indeed very interesting. So what I, was, uh, what I wanted to sort of talk about today was really my view that 
you know, there are enormous opportunities here for health and quality of life, as long as we see it as a whole of community commitment. And, and that's really basically where I've come from. Uh, the state of California did raise $3 billion in general obligation bonds, and it was created really by a referendum of the, in the state. 60% of the Californian people wanted to have these bonds available to do medical research in stem cells because they felt that they had a commitment, they could get a commitment from their scientists to, to take this area to new heights because President Bush at the time, and who was, who was president at the time, was, was very negative about embryonic stem cells. So here is a community in California wanting to do something which is really quite different to um, what had been going on before. Just leaving it to the public, the federal funding opportunities, I think is a mistake. And I think we need to all to be involved and all to own the, the interests of driving medical research forward. So in this talk, I want to have a few things that you know, I'd like to take away from a, the talk. And, and some of those are written here. I mean, what is the economic benefit to the community of basic and translational research? Is there an economic driver here that's worthwhile and becomes a, a useful um, tool for persuading politicians to really get behind this work? And why not? Why don't we invest and punt, if you like, in medical research? I mean, we, we're pretty good at horses and, and, and other forms of gambling in Australia, but in many respects, we, we really don't look at the stock market as a way to invest in biotechnology, nor do we see it as an investment in, in our health going forward. So why not? Why not, why not this as is is, is an area to invest for the, for the future? And I want to talk to you about why we need public and private co-investment, because I don't think it is the complete onus of the public to, to fund all this work. And I think the private sector has a really critical role to play, and I need, it needs to be engaged, and engaged in a far better way than it currently does here in Victoria or Australia. And we need to rethink the way we fund research. I believe it's not uh, presently sustainable, and I'll get to that towards the end of my talk. I think that what we're doing currently and the way we're awarding grants to scientists will not survive. And I think it, 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 there is a chance there could be a catastrophic event in research which would leave you generations of scientists out, out of research and leave, you, leave Australia in a, in, a, in a very desperate situation. And, it's, and it's, we see this also in the US, so it's, it's really quite common to some of the economies that really have... Um, have a set amount of dollars available and there's a, and there's a really strong demand on the use of those, those monies for, for a, variety of, a variety of things. So I want you to think about those things as you sort of walk through this. So I took out uh, some, just some recent uh, work, some publications. Uh, this was in BMC Medicine this year and they were looking at estimating returns to the United Kingdom of publicly funding cancer-related uh, research. And that was a total expenditure in 1970 to 2009 of 15 billion. They looked at the net monetary benefit of prioritised inventions due to this research, it was 124 billion. So this is a very good return on, on, on any basis. It's an internal rate of return for an elapsed time of 15 years of 10%. Well, if you're getting a 10% return on your money, that's as good as, as it gets in many areas of, of, of the private sector. And we can compare that to previous estimates of 9% for cardiovascular research. If you look at the, the economic impact of the human genome, that can be extraordinary. That's how, this is a report by the Battelle Technology Partnership practice in May 2011, where they analysed how $3.8 billion investment drove 396 billion in economic impact, created 310,000 jobs and launched a whole genomic revolution. So the returns on this inside, in, in, the, in this case, uh, inside 23 years is phenomenal. And it is, and it is way better than you, you can do by investing in many others. So this is government investing in basic research. You can find plenty of examples of this. 
The NIH has got examples. I guess the NIH and MRC should have examples. You can look at the benefits of the of basic research, and if you make if you make an investment in basic and translational research, you can have an incredibly large impact for the dollar invested. So it is a good investment from the public's point of view. So what are we doing in this regenerative medicine field? Well, there's sort of five key sectors, for which I'll only talk about a few. The uh, cell therapies for such things as heart disease, diabetes, vision disorders, neurological disorders, the tissue engineering uh, for organ replacement, tissue regrowth, bone and cartilage, and wound healing. All, these are all things that are on the move at the present time. The regenerative compounds, the compounds that, re, that actually trigger endogenous regeneration, and we find factors that can actually get your stem cells regenerating your own tissues. There's often a limit to that, but there are some very good uh, factors. The Wnt, uh, the Wnt um, uh, growth factor systems uh, are very effective, uh, and there are many others that can be used in this way for anemia, advanced wound healing, and advanced fracture healing. There's the ascetic medicine for dermal fillers, hair restoration, anti-aging and anti-wrinkle, and tooth regeneration. These things are happening out there. And there's also tools and, and devices. For, these are delivery devices, cell assays, and predictive toxicology and bioinformatics. So it's a very broad spectrum of regenerative medicine. And so we're, we're looking at a very broad field. And I'm going to concentrate this talk pretty much on the cell therapies. So the applications for, for therapeutic research for cell therapies are in cardio, cardiovascular disease, orthopedic disease, diabetes, central nervous system, and cancer and hematological diseases. So these cover large markets of unmet medical needs with the aim of curing uh, and treating these diseases. So currently in many of these areas, there is no treatment available or there is very poor treatment available. And you will know if you have relatives and friends uh, that often this, this treatment is really unsatisfactory. Um, we see that, I hear about it. My relatives, my friends are going through a lot of these diseases as I grow older. And, and I, I think it's in many ways, you know, pretty unacceptable, you know, what the outcomes are. So let's go drive it back, just so that I bring you all on board here. What's a stem cell? Why are they important? What can we do with them? So if you take a fertilized egg, uh, you can de it will develop a cleavage stage embryo. So an eight, at eight cells, it divides two, four, eight. At, at eight cells, it's totipotent. Every one of those cells can go and form a whole individual. So they call that totipotency. By the time it gets to what we call a blastocyst stage, which is about day four of development, uh, the cells on the inside uh, become known as pluripotent, and they're also immortal. These cells can be grown in culture and cultured in the, in the laboratory, and they will actually go to form all the cells of the, of the body, except for the placenta. And if you allow development to continue normally from this stage, of course, there will be stem cells that are multipotent in all the different tissues and, and finally fully mature end stage developed cells. So people like um, Martin Perra, who's here with us, who, and others who are in the community driving these interests about how, to make, how do you make these cells turn into all the cells that we're interested in and what governs uh, their effectiveness in, in growing in those ways. And it was Martin and myself and some uh, colleagues who in the mid 90s decided to try and do that from human embryos, which caused a little bit of a fuss at the time, but uh, is now really part of what this current revolution is. Um, these, these, are, these, are, these are all important matters, um, but what, what, what did happen from our understanding of those embryonic stem cells that we grew in a dish was that there was a certain panel of what we call transcription factors that are, that are identified here. These transcription factors govern the way the genes are being expressed in the embryonic stem cell. So these transcription factors, if they're inserted into a blood cell or a skin cell of an adult, 
they will actually turn into the equivalent or almost equivalent of embryonic stem cells. Therefore, we can take samples from any person, every person in this room we could take samples for, and we could turn them back into the equivalent of embryonic stem cells that can go and form all the different cells of the body. And again, these cells are immortal. They keep growing forever. So we can make billions and billions of them. So this, this development um, was really, it's really sort of changed many aspects of, of the research again, because it opened up uh, really an incredible area of research that, that allows us to explore many, many different things. You're, if you've been at a university, you know that there's animal houses full of mice. Uh, often they're, they're genetically, been genetically sec selected or manipulated to, to give, a give a, an example of a human disease. But they are only models of the human disease. This way, we can actually take the cells from people who have a disease and we can create these embryonic stem cells and we can drive them into whatever cells we want, cardiac cells or neural cells, and we can analyse what these cells are, whether they're different to people who don't have that disease. And we, we've got very neat ways now of, of being able to manipulate those genes and we can tell you which gene pathway is aberrant and then whether this is, if this was a whole population of people who had diabetes, you might find that there are 10 different groups of people and they're different because their gene pathways are all different. And in fact, the disease is very heterogeneous. It's not common like the animal model that we had in the laboratory. So now we can start studying human disease. So here's an example. You could take uh, patients with cardiac disease and you can take the skin cells or the blood cells and turn them into patient-specific induced pluripotential stem cells. These are the equivalent to the embryonic stem cells. And then we can turn them into cardiomyocytes. So we've worked out how to differentiate those cells into functional cardiomyocytes. You could use those for cell therapy, and some people are working on that now in patch technology or introducing the cells into patients. Or you can use these cells for drug screening, and pharmacogenetics and toxicology. So these cells then represent you know, an important new a basis because they are reflecting the disease of the patient and you can compare that to, to cells that do not have the disease, that come from patients who don't have the disease. Now you can start to analyse whether they're, new, they're drugs which will respond, that the, these cells will respond to in a way that brings them back to the normal and these could end up as small molecules uh, uh, and gene therapies in the future. So there's a there's a really big development going on here for a new drug development in many different diseases, looking for drugs that can actually affect this disease in the dish models and bring the, bring the disorder back to normal. And so they become new drugs that could be explored out there in the, in the community for treating medicine. But they all also can tell you which patients will respond and which patients will possibly not respond, and maybe even those patients who respond adversely. So many drugs fail because of adverse responses. And if you could take out the group that, adver that, that responds adversely, the cost of drug development would come down dramatically. So these are really important uh, new developments that are in the lab. So the first wave of cell therapies that's going are the use of these so-called multi or adult multipotent cells so the bone marrow cells, or what they call mesenchymal stem cells, which are stromal bone marrow cells, um, uh, or neural stem cells. Um, and these cells normally, multipotent cells, form the, the, the cells of, the, of that particular type. They don't go and form other cells, so a neural stem cell will only form nerves and glia. So these are the, the neuronal system. And, and cells, stem cells from the blood, will only form the blood cells. It forms a lot of different types of blood cells, but only blood cells. They don't jump across lineages. They don't form muscle. They don't form bone and so on. So, so these are, this is what's going on in the sort of first wave of, uh, of, of studies of, of clinical trials that are going on. Mostly, unfortunately, mostly, 
They don't understand what the cells are actually doing. The mechanism of action is not clear. So they're trying the cells out because they can see in some animal models they get a response. But they don't understand very well what those, uh, what those cells are doing. So I would predict a lot of these first wave of studies will not, will not succeed. They will probably fail somewhere along the line. And this is typical of a new field, let's try everything mentality in the first phase. And you've got to wait for the second wave or the third wave to really bring the, the, the high value medicine through. So, so in the first, first instance, if you see failures of biotech companies that are happening in this first wave, it's kind of expected because the, really the science underpinning the use of those cells was not as firm as it should have been. And this is something that scientists really care about. Uh, but the opportunity, of course, of, of maybe serendipity or by good chance of doing something with these cells that might have an impact is often thought to be worthwhile. And if you can see benefit in an animal model, well, why wouldn't you try it? in the human. Now, if you look at the global cell and tissue-based therapy sector, and this is some data that, that the, the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine uh, uh, obtained in 2013, you can see there's a lot of this. Uh, these are the first stage studies. So there's a lot of cell therapies actually going on out there. So there's 54 late stage uh, therapies with 43 companies. 209 mid-stage therapies with 114 companies and 63 early stage with 40, 49 companies. And you can see it covers a really, you know, a wide area of, of, of different opportunities there. So this is the first wave. So as I say, there are a lot of opportunities out there at the moment, but I'm not all that confident that too many of them will end up in the kind of treatments that we'll, we'll, we'll need or we'll, we'll be using forever more. It may be some of them will have a positive impact and be used, but I think the second and third waves will probably be a lot better at what they're doing. So one of the concerns I had in terms of biotechnology industry, if you looked at the global cell and tissue-based uh, therapeutic sector on these clinical trials, you actually don't see Australia listed here. So there are many places throughout the world where these studies are, are ongoing, but there's not much business being done in Australia, right? Why not? You know, we're a very smart, science-based uh, society, community. We know how to do these things. Why aren't we in there? Why aren't we doing these things? We actually do have one of the best companies in the space, Mesa, Mesoblast, but mostly they're doing their studies overseas. But uh, there's, there's not a lot of activity. And I, I'll come back to this at the end. We need to get the biotechnology industry really moving in, in, in Australia, particularly in Victoria, where, where it could be linked up with some of the best research that is available in the world. The research is, particularly here in Melbourne, incredibly strong, but they're not well connected to the biotech industry. And they need to be, because it needs to be a private public public-private relationship that's going to deliver these things. And there's not much evidence that Australia is performing well at this point in time. So what did we do in California? And not what I actually did, but the people of California created Proposition 71 as a vote. And that authorised essential research for new cures intended to save millions of lives. So this was $3 billion of US funds. So this is a lot of money. So I had charge of this for near on seven years, six and a half years, and, and it was the community that developed this. These, the state of California said, we want to invest in research. We want to buy the bonds. The Californians wanted to buy the bonds. So these were the people and the companies and the institutes of California that were willing to put in $3 billion in this area because they believed that the scientists had something there that would be really worthwhile. So here is the community doing something. So the, the, the other part of what they, what they did when they form, formed this uh, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, they included patient advocates from a very wide sector of, of, of interest on the board. 
and, and also in review. So these patient advocates would join, join the, the scientists in, in, in looking to see where this money should be spent and how effectively it could be done. So here is the community becoming part of that. So this is another thing that we haven't done in Australia. We haven't included people who have strong interests. I mean, it's the patient advocates who, who want things done about cancer, want things done about diabetes, sort of for, their, for their children, genetic diseases. Why not include them? Because they will be, they will be really effective supporters and they will also influence the politicians considerably. People will say, well, a scientist just want to do that because it gives them a job. But if you have patient advocates who believe in this, then you're going to have a, you know, a better argument to the community, to the politicians, that this is an important component of work. So, so I think it was a big and positive step. And while I was there, we, I really awarded close on two billion of their dollars uh, there was others, other parts of that fund that were all, all committed or, or uh, agreed to by the board. So in fact, I'd spent the majority of their money. There was a small amount of money for, for running the management and the review of all of the grants and so on. So uh, in, you can see here from these pie charts that uh, improved in concept was was really a lot of development on clinical trial work where most of the money needs to be spent. So if you look at you know, the way the money was spent, it, it, was, it was both in training the scientists, developing the institutes, uh, enabling the, the, the tools and technology, but also basic research, ensuring that they had the basic research, making appointments into the, into the universities and research centres and companies, and then driving the clinical trials. And it was driving the clinical trials which is really the most expensive part of that. So during that time I was there, we awarded around 600 research grants um, uh, to facilities uh, and over 60 institutes and companies. We built 12 new institutes and centres in California. We only used, we used 270 million of that, but we, we, we were able to get one, $1.2 billion of private donation to help us put those institutes up. And they became naming rights for these new institutes there. We've had over 800 major scientific papers published. And for scientists, uh, there was more than 25% of them in the high impact factor journals. So there's impact factor larger than 10. So we were having a huge impact in the, in the field. We brought many new researchers to California and we eventually had 90 plus translation development projects. These are projects on their way to the clinic. So 30 of them were really development projects going to the clinic and 63 were early translational projects getting ready for it. So we spent over 600 million towards these translational programs of the $1.8 billion that I was awarding there. So I decided when I, when I was there to, to build these partnerships in, in translation and preclinical research with the academia, industry, and clinical medicine, because I thought you had to have these component parts together. Basically, if you just funded academia, I'll tell you, well, the academia, academics will get lost, they won't sort of focus on the translation, it's not an area of high publication value, you know, they won't do it properly. Um, the industry is really funded on milestones, and needs to get funding every time it gets to a new milestone. So you've got a stop-start process if you're just funding industry alone. And clinical medicine, the docs go off and do a few clinical trials and then they go home and they don't do it anymore and they go and do a new set of trials. So it's sort of, that doesn't work very well funding them individually. But if you fund them together, you bring, you bring the academia with the deep resources together with industry, which has got high focus, uh, and knows what it's got to do for, for the regulator and getting work ready for clinical trials, and then get the clinical people integrated in this proper science, proper industry approach, you will be much more effective. And that seemed to work very well for, for the, the projects that we, we funded. And, and the type of projects are shown here, there was a lot of neurological industry, and neuro, neurodegenerative disorders, 
op ophthalmology because the eye is a, is a principal target for, for a lot of cell therapies, HIV AIDS. I'll come back and talk about a few, more, few of these things in more detail in a minute. But I didn't realise that we'd have a cure for HIV AIDS. And we, we really do have, looks like, a cure that's going to ha happen for HIV AIDS. Blood disorders, cardiovascular research, and metabolic disorders such as diabetes and so on. So we had a wide range of studies that we, that, that we invested in. By the time I'd left, we had patients enrolling for HIV AIDS, that is, uh, is a cure for HIV AIDS, uh, patients who have congestive heart failure after heart attack, patients with cancer who have solid tumours and leukaemias, patients with degenerative eye diseases who are losing their vision, patients with diabetes, type 1 diabetes in particular, which impact on young and old, diverse ethnic backgrounds, and patients with serious blood diseases like sickle cell disease, beta thalassemia, which particularly impacts an early age of, of young people, again, with diverse ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. So just to, just to take you through a few of these, we invested 94 million in the neurological disorders, including epilepsy, stroke, spinal muscular atrophy, which is a, is a terrible disease for young children, autism, Huntington's disease, uh, spinal cord injury. And let's just show you one picture of this. Here's some modelling done on uh, an autism disorder, and you see the same thing in schizophrenia. Now, I didn't realise that we could play such a role in these serious mental disorders. But you here you have on the left, these are IPS cells that have been taken from patients, skin cells taken from patients with autism or schizophrenia, and then they're grown to IPS cells and then grown out into neurons. If you look on the left-hand side, this is what a normal neuron in its, in its axons and dendrites looks like. And then on the right-hand side, is what a patient who has autism or schizophrenia looks like. So we see a dramatic disease in a dish model happening here, where you can tell the size of the midbody, the number of axons, the, the connections here in the dendrites, are all very different, right? And then we can work on drugs that can actually make these, if you, if you treat these cells uh, uh, as, as the IPS cells with these drugs, you get them to be more in the normal range. Can you reverse these conditions using drugs, uh, using these models? It's very likely that you, that you can. So this is work that's currently in progress. And now, I hadn't thought about these diseases when I first started in California, but it's very clear that we can show these dramatic differences in a dish from these cells taken from patients that we've turned into the equivalent of embryonic stem cells and then grown them out into neurons and then analyse these cells. And then if you use, dr you use drugs, you can use big panels of drugs to screen for whether you can turn these cells into more normal looking cells than the pathological type of cells. And then these drugs become candidates for, for exploration for, for new drugs. And I see new drugs going to be expanding, particularly in these areas in the near future. So this is, this is really important. There's some wonderful work going on at, at a company called Stem Cells Inc. And I have to tell you, I'm on the board of Stem Cells Inc. I've just recently gone on the board. So anyone who's been reading newspapers will recognise it caused a bit of furore as I left. But this, this company is a very good company. It, it uses... Um, it uses neural stem cells and it's been doing transplant of those cells into spinal, injured spinal cord. And this, this injury that, that, that happens in, in patients due to accidents, motor accidents or accidents, sporting accidents and so forth, is a real, is a real problem because essentially there's really no real treatment for these patients. So you, you can see the injury shown here. And uh, here's an operation on the, on the patient. You can see there's a sort of big hole in the, in the middle of their spinal cord and there's no chance that the messages coming from 
anterior can go to the posterior. So there's no chance of, of having any movement and feeling go across that space. Now, can we repair that? And using these company using stem cells, these neural stem cells, mean injecting them into the spinal cord of patients. So here's here's a subject three um, at Ada, Asia Asia A type patient. You can see the feelings that the patients have are either green that they're absent, impaired. Oh, so red is absent. Sorry, green is normal, and, and the yellow is impaired. This is before the transplant, and this is after the transplant. So there's, there's clearly been a response in this patient. Uh, here's another patient, uh, again with uh, responses shown there. And you can see in this patient that before and after, there's really quite a difference in the, in the, in the ability for the nerves to, to pick up messages coming from the anterior to the posterior. So these are patients who are showing some response. And in one patient now, they've had a patient who's, who's able to now use his, both his bowel and his bladder. Now, I remember when, in the early days when we were thinking about this work, that if patients could get back the use of their bowel and their bladder, that this would be an enormous step forward for them. They would regain some of their dignity, principal dignity that they'd lost because they couldn't control that anymore. So if we can, if we at least can do this in some of these patients, there's now movement forward. So I think this work is important, it's going very well, and I'm very happy to be associated with that. We're also working in Lou Gehrig's disease, this is the motor neuron diseases, Alzheimer's disease. It's a terribly difficult disease to, to work with Alzheimer's because we still don't understand that disease well enough. And in Parkinson's disease, so for these kind of diseases, we need truckloads of cells, huge amounts of cells. So we had to go into manufacturing, and we've been getting work done with manufacturing so that we can actually make these cells. So we, we grow them in 3D hydrogel suspension cultures these days. And here, I can show you, just shown in this white here, we're able to make, in theory at least, over 280 days, 10 to the 72 cells. So, I don't know, I think 10 to the 72 cells might actually fill this convention centre. Um, that's an awful lot of cells. So, we, we, we started in on the manufacturing in a very serious way, and, and we can we now make these cells from IPS cells, and these, these cells are dopamine-producing cells that you would really need for, for treating patients with Parkinson's disease. So in Parkinson's disease, you need to replace these cells here in the um, substantia nigra that, that have lost their ability to produce dopamine. And you know that Parkinson's disease is a terrible disease. It's an ongoing disease and really has very little opportunity for, for any other treatment at the present time. There has been some studies on the use of fetal cells to, to help these patients, but um, and there is one, one study still with fetal cells going on in Europe. Uh, we, we would hope to be able to develop these cells from human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotential stem cells in a, in a system uh, shown here, differentiation system, and it's not, it's not important to know how it's done, but you can grow very large numbers of cells from those. And then we need to be able to insert them in a very effective way. So, here we've funded work on a new instrument that will actually deliver these cells in a much more effective way than just injecting them through a syringe. Um, and, and, and these developments, these tools and technologies that need to go along with this, important. We would hope that w work on Parkinson's disease with human embryonic derived cells will happen in the near future uh, as clinical trials. These are the kind of neural cells that have produced dopamine that we need to be able to grow in very large numbers and then use for, use for these patients. Uh, uh, hopefully that will correct and reverse their Parkinson's disease. Therapy in cancer uh, for leukaemias and brain and solid tumours uh, has been ongoing. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about some work that I think is, is fascinating and really interesting, and I hope that I might be involved in some of that work here in, in, in Melbourne. It's called a CAR technology, 
a chimeric antigen technology. So what we're interested in is instead of the, 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 the normal approach to cancer therapy, which is subdue the immune system, take the immune system out, deplete the immune system, and then, and then try and get rid of the cancer by chemoradiotherapy and, and surgery, we want to arm the, the immune system with angry T cells. T cells that will chew up the tumour in situ. We have T cells, killer T cells in the immune system. They're very effective in taking out unwanted abnormal cells, but we need to arm them for the cancer because the cancers overwhelm our T cells and don't allow us to be able to kill it. We also produce antibodies to cancers, but again, the antibodies are not effective because they're not tough enough to take out the cancer. So what we're doing and what the researchers are doing in the US and have shown some very interesting results I'm going to tell you about now, is that if you, if you understand what the tumour is, that we need to take a sample of this tumour. So we need to know what's expressed on the surface of the tumour. So if we know that there's a specific antigen expressed on the surface of the tumour that's not expressed on other cells, we build that into the T cells through what we call a chimeric antigen uh, engineering. <coughs> so we take the patient's T cells and we engineer into them uh, the antigen or antigens that are being expressed by this, by this cancer. And then, we, and then we multiply these cells and we give them back to the patient. And this is a, a very effective form of therapy. So just showing you here, normally what happens, this is a cancer cell and this is your T cell here. Normally the T cell is looking for a HLA type to, 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 to recognise uh, an abnormal cell. But what we're giving it is a surface, uh, a surface marker here, a tumour-specific antigen, which we build into the immunoglobulin heavy and light chains that recognises the antigen on the surface of the tumour. And this, when these two then interact, we get an incredibly effective killing. And these T cells will go and kill hundreds of cancer cells. So what's been happening here is, 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 is some very effective therapy. So here we show you a patient with metastatic melanoma here. Two years later, after treatment with the, uh, these, uh, these T cells, these CAR T cells, the tumour's essentially gone. And four years later, this patient is completely clear. Here's a table showing some work from colleagues of mine in New York where they've been treating patients uh, with acute lymphoblastic leukaemia. And the important part here is they had an 88% survival rate. So I got some recent, more recent data was provided by these researchers at the International Stem Cell Research Society. So their 88 or 86% effective rate of treating cancer is continuing. And um, what's important about this is the patients that they're working on are end stage cancer patients. Everyone's given up. These patients have got one or two months to live, they're dead. They're essentially nothing can be done for these patients. They have kilograms of tumour, kilograms, right? Massive amount of tumours in them. So what you do is you arm these T cells and you give them back to the patients and they have a fierce, a fierce, fierce fever. Because if you're going to kill that much cancer cells, it's like, it's like a flu cubed. You're going to, you're going to have a fever to, to die for. It's actually quite dangerous. So you, the clinicians have to be very careful with these patients so they don't get into cytokine overload. And they have now ways of sort of making sure you don't slip over the edge on this. But these patients are being cured of these tumours completely in 9 to 59 days. They have no tumour left at all. And it's 86 to 88% of these patients with absolutely no tumour left. None. So this, this is from patients that are given up on. And we know that they know the fever is related to the, the, the tumour load. So if you were able to treat patients had smaller tumours, you wouldn't have such vicious fevers and it would be easier to treat them. This is the kind of treatment we need here, here in Melbourne, in Australia. We've got to have it because I, I, I don't like the way my relatives are being treated. And, and it was, it's just a few days ago I was talking to my relatives and they're getting the old treatment. 
and this new treatment is coming, but it hasn't got here fast enough. But we need to bring it, we need to introduce it, we need to have it here. And so that's what I think I should end up getting involved in. So we can, we can do other things with this. We can turn these T cells into what we call IPS cells again. As I said, you can take them. They still recognise the, the antigen, chimera antigens intact. We can grow billions of them. We can have them in the, in the lab. We can keep them for the patient. So if anything, if that tumour ever turns up again, we can go and give them the T cells, all right? So it's, this is a really cool system. It will be good insurance. It will be a good effective treatment. It looks like something that's going to really take a, make a huge difference in cancer. So this is a cell therapy, and it's some of these therapies that we've been working on in, in uh, California. In patients with HIV AIDS, we have taken two different approaches here, and the words don't matter so much. What, what is important, though, this virus, this HIV virus, this is the viral membrane of the virus. It needs to bond with the blood cell through two receptors, the CD4 receptor, but also the CCR5 co-receptor. Now, what, what's really interesting about this is that in the north of, north of Scandinavia and Russia, there are patients who have got mutations in the CCR5 gene. And if they've got mutations, homozygous mutations in both, both chromosomes, they never get HIV AIDS. They never get AIDS, never. They never get AIDS. Never. And this mutation is not present in Africa and it's not present in, in any other places. This only comes from the north of Scandinavia and Russia. Now, we decided to mutate patients' blood stem cells so that all the blood stem cells that, that were developed from there would have a mutation in this. So then the virus can't attach to the cells, can't attach to any blood cells. So if you, if you then introduce that into the, into the patients, then you should have an effective uh, um, cure for HIV AIDS. And indeed, that's what happened um, with a patient called, uh, his name is Timothy Ray Brown, and he was given a bone marrow transplant from a donor who had this, who had this mutation in both, both their alleles, in both their genes, both chromosomes. And he, this patient, a doctor, in, a very smart doctor in, in Berlin, went out and found this matched bone marrow and, and transplanted it into Tim because he had AIDS-related cancer and also was, had a heavy dose of uh, HIV AIDS. He's completely clear of the disease and all his blood cells are now made up by those donor cells. So we've converted, what happened was all, all of the cells, his own blood cells, died off, but all the ones of the bone marrow transplants are all survived because they're completely immune, if you like, to, to invasion by, by the virus. And there is no reservoir of, of HIV in this patient. So we're interested to know what will happen in the clinical trials. Will we get rid of the reservoirs in all these patients? But these are the studies that we're currently now doing in, in clinical trials. So, so one approach is using a zinc finger nuclease to mutate that CCR5 gene, and we put it in the blood stem cell, which goes to produce all the, all the cells of the body, in particular T cells and macrophages, which are the ones which are destroyed by the virus. Uh, we're also using a short hairpin RNA to, to block the CCR together with a fusion uh, protein and, and that's a different approach because we wanted to try two different approaches. And then finally we have the opportunity, if any cells remain, to use this CAR technology again. So you can use, again, the CAR technology for killing these cells, just the same as a cancer cell. So we don't have any new antibiotics going, right? So we've got a lot of Unfortunately, there's a lot of antibiotic-resistant bugs out there. And if you get one of these antibiotic-resistant bugs and you happen to be in hospital, it's a very serious problem. You can die from that. And uh, this is another way of attacking those infected cells. 
So we think we could use that car technology again. Looking at the eye diseases, um, you lose central vision because your retinal cells are destroyed as you get older. And if you lose those retinal cells, they're responsible for keeping your photoreceptor cells healthy. And if you're able to, if you we're able to grow these embryonic stem cells into retinal epithelial cells now, and we have them on a parallel membrane, and we just slip them into the macula, and we see that these these animals then are able to maintain sight in a in a perfectly good vision uh, in, in a normal way. So those those studies are under clinical trials. Also for diabetes, we're finding an approach where we're growing embryonic stem cells here into um, uh, beta cell um, insulin producing progenitor cells where we put in a capsule and we put that subcutaneous. Currently it's in animals, but it's going to clinical trials later this year in humans. And these are the, these are the, the, the insulin beta cells shown here expressing the right things, including insulin, and they're inside this capsule, and that allows glucose and insulin to get in and get out, and other factors to, to exit and enter, and nutrients to get in, but it stops all of the immune cells getting in. Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease, so you've got to protect these cells. You couldn't put them in the patient without protection because the, the patient will kill them. So th this, this study, you can show in animals that it effectively controls their glucose levels. If you take out, take out that capsule, immediately the glucose levels go up. So I wanted to finish off. So there's some extraordinary things happening there. So I just wanted to finish up with the conundrum of the new scientist, you know, the young scientist who, who, who wants to get in this area. So kind of now takes on average 15 to 20 grand applications for a new principal investigator to be awarded one research grant in the US. And the average age of your first research grant now is 45 years and growing. So the first grant that you ever get on average is now when you're 45 as a scientist. I used to write three grants a year and expect one or possibly two. I was always optimistic for two. Rarely did I get it. More like zero or one. But, but that's a very big difference in the number of grants you need to write. The, the number of research scientists being trained is way more than the research institutes, academia and business can accommodate. The funding quantum is remaining the same. Hence, the competition for grants is just skyrocketing. So we have to make a change, we really do. We have to increase the private sector jobs, biotech companies, they have to. We have to increase and expand these biotech companies. We need to do that, we must do that. We have to make a change, we really have to. And universities, uh, their, their principal researchers must stop just training trainee graduates and using them as cheap labour for their research, because it can't continue. It just can't, because there's just no positions for these people. And it's, it's a tragedy, and it's going to get worse. Um, and I have, you know, I have examples very close to me of, of young people who are really great scientific scientists. They really potentially great scientists who don't want to go into science anymore because eight months writing research grants is not research, certainly not the research that I used to do. So we've got to change. We have to change that. And I know that the established scientists won't want to change because they're, they're doing all right and why would you want to change? But you have, we, have to, we have to change this. We really must. Otherwise, we, we're going to be in, in trouble. So I just want to end up in, in saying I think it takes courage, determination, resources and commitment to defeat these kind of intractable diseases and injuries. We need to engage the whole community in the process if we're going to be successful. And I think that's the message that I really wanted to end up with. And I wanted to thank the ITC's Life Sciences Forum you know, for doing this. I, I think they're great. Uh, Luan and Ismail and colleagues have uh, done a fantastic job and, and they deserve, you know, they deserve a lot of work lot of acclaim for what they've done, a lot of recognition. I think sponsors have enabled the forum to operate for six years, I understand, engineering, biology and physical sciences, and pathways for communicating these new exciting developments to the community, and a way for the community to be involved with science, 
and technology and to seek answers to where this may be taking us. And it's apolitical. We don't, this is not a political organisation. It's without an agenda. It's open to everyone who may be interested. And that's what I think is wonderful about this. It's not, it's not agendised. And we need to continue to find sponsors who care about our future and the direction science can take us. And I think that message, my message, is, is the message of ICT. And I applaud them and I, and I thank them for this opportunity to talk in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Trounson, for that talk. I think it took us on a journey. One would have anticipated when you started off working with livestock all those years ago that you'd now be talking about potential cures for cancer and HIV AIDS. So it's been a scientific and personal journey for you. Uh, you've courted controversy a lot of the time because of the pioneering aspect of your research. Uh, today we've been taken on a journey about how to fund research in the future and I think it links in very nicely with the McKeon review findings where we have to really combine with the community politicians and academia to fund research at its most optimal level. That's not being done now and I see the young researchers in my team being discouraged by the current environment we need to change it. So that was an excellent note to end on. And I'd like to thank Lewin and ICT Life Sciences also for sponsoring such a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. One or two. Thank you, our sponsors. Um, thank you, Alan, for uh, uh, giving recognition to the work of the forum. And, and really, it's a sponsor-funded event. Uh, we wouldn't be here, Alan wouldn't be here, uh, if it was not for the generosity of the sponsor. So uh, please join with me in uh, thanking them for uh, making this event and the series of events possible. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and you can follow us on Twitter and the ICT for Life Sciences Forum website. I also want to say a special thank you to uh, the Club Melbourne Ambassador Program and the Melbourne Convention and Exhibition Centre for hosting us this evening. Please join with me in thanking Alan for his uh, commitment to be here this evening. It's the first uh, presentation he's given since he's returned back from the US, so we're very grateful for you uh, making that commitment, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much.